I'm gonna show you exactly how I make my YouTube videos from scripting, recording, editing, down to the thumbnail. I'm showing you everything. And we'll start first with talking about my scripting process. So the scripting process for me is extremely important and I typically spend a significant amount of time scripting. So I script all of my videos word for word. I have to do that because I am a huge rambler. Like when I'm talking, I digress so much that if I don't script my videos, then the point of the video is gonna be lost super quickly because I'm just gonna keep on digressing over and over again. Plus scripting word for word Word just helps me to really drive the video forward and just to help me keep the theme at the center of the video. So one of the questions that I got from you guys was, Joshua, do you use a teleprompter? And the answer is no, I do not. So what I do is I have my phone with me and in front of me is my script, right? Or on the side of me is my script. And so what I'll do is I've got like paragraphs of information that I'll look at, I'll quickly memorize it, um, or just like, you know, vaguely see the point that I wanna make and I'll set the phone down and I'll say the point, right? Like that, what I just told you was one of the points on my script that I remember. And so, although it's not verbatim, I'm not reading the script verbatim, I do understand what the general context of the, bu of the bullet point is. And so I can just quickly say it back to you guys and keep it as natural as possible. Now, in terms of what I use to write my scripts, I use toilet paper. And I like toilet paper because it's very tactile. I can just lay it down and start writing my scripts. And I can just, when I'm finished, roll it up. <laughs> I'm joking. So I use um, something called Craft. And you can think of Craft as a minimalistic version of Notion. I feel like a lot of you probably know what Notion is. I heard somebody say once that Notion was for people who uh, pretended to be busy but they were actually just busy trying to organize their Notion instead of actually working. That's what I heard, I don't know if it's true or not. If you use Notion and you love Notion, shout out to you. I personally just don't like Notion. But I love Craft for its simple user interface, speed, and minimalistic design. So as you can see, I've got my Craft open and here are all the documents that live within Craft. However, the real power of Craft is the organization. So over here on this left-hand side, you've got all your folders. And I've got a few different folders but the one that I use the most is my YouTube folder. And so if I open up my YouTube folder, you can see that I've got all these different subfolders and sub subfolders, and I can set folders to have little icons or emojis if I want. I can change their color, but this is where I manage and organize all of my scripts, you know, future, past, and present, uh, my sponsors, ideas, etc. And so if I go into my scripts folder, and let me just show you an example of how my scripts typically look. Sometimes I'll just create my scripts using bullet points, like in this example, or I'll just write out all the points in paragraphs. But as you can see, I am writing out the complete video, even down to some of the uh, natural filler words that I use. I mean, I am literally just writing it out exactly how I would say it. But the thing that I really like about Craft is how I can also format the text. And so for example, if I click on this text here and highlight it, I have the option to of course, bold and italicize, but I can even highlight this text different colors, which I do use this a lot, like in this example, to indicate to myself that this part of the script is going to be a scene change or something else. I'll highlight that part of the script a different color to remind myself when I'm recording that something different has to happen here. Then once I finish writing the script, either on my computer or on my iPad, I'll pull it up on my phone and I can go sit in my chair, have my script next to me and just, you know, read off of it. Imagine you're going grocery shopping one day and a random stranger stops you and says, Hey, uh, could you give me your first name, last name, home address, phone number, social security number, the name of your relatives, the name of your kids, your work address, and any other personal information that you'd like to give me? You would give this random stranger your information, wouldn't you? Of course you wouldn't. But unfortunately, this exact thing is happening to you every single day without you even knowing it. I, for example, recently discovered that my information was being used and sold by 30 to data brokers without my consent. And this would explain why I am always getting spam calls and text messages. Luckily, because of today's sponsor, Aura, they'll automatically request that my information is removed from these sites. You've heard me talk about Aura before. It's the app that I use to protect my data from hackers, spammers, and scammers. Aura continuously monitors the dark web looking for your emails, passwords, and social security number and sends alerts fast to your phone or email when they find anything to help protect you 
from identity theft. Identity theft is so common that there's a new victim about every 14 seconds. This means that since I began talking about Aura, about four people have had their identity stolen. Protect yourself and your family from identity theft today by going to Aura.com slash Joshua Mayo or by clicking the link in the description below. And if you sign up right now using my link, Aura will give you a two-week free trial so that you can protect your personal information from data brokers and hackers on the dark web. And that brings us to the next part of the video. Let's talk about recording, how I record, what camera I use, all the in-camera settings, audio, my lighting, etc. Starting with the camera. So what camera do I use? I use the Sony a7S Mark III with a Sigma 16 millimeter lens. Now I love this camera. And the reason I love this camera is for really a variety of reasons. But the main reason is because the image that it produces is amazing. So the a7S III can shoot 4K and 10-bit 422, whereas most cameras are typically only shooting 8-bit 422. Now, without turning into a full-on tech YouTuber, what exactly does this mean? Cameras that can only shoot 8-bit 422 have a range of colors up to a max of 256. This means there can only be 256 shades of red, blue, and green, whereas with a 10-bit 422 camera, the range of colors increases to 1,024 shades of red, blue, and green. This difference in color range makes a massive difference, especially when color grading your footage when you're shooting in an S-Log format, which I do. Now about that, when I'm filming my videos, I'm typically shooting S-Log3 with an S-Log Gamut 3.Cine color mode. This means my footage looks like this when I'm recording, but when I bring it into my editing software and color grade it, it looks like this. Now the reason I shoot in S-Log is because it gives me a lot more control over what the final image is going to look like because I have complete control over all the colors, all the contrast, everything. I have full control of what the image is going to look like. And I'll talk a little bit more with you guys about how I color grade my footage once we get into the editing part of this video. But that right there is my camera setup. Audio. Let's talk about audio. So as I previously mentioned, I use the Sennheiser MK H416, the quality and the clarity of audio that this mic is going to produce is just incredible. And then I've got my mic running into this Motu M2 audio interface via XLR. And as I mentioned before, all this does is it converts the analog audio signal into a digital signal that I can then bring into Logic Pro and enhance it if I want, which I do. Now, like I said, I could technically, the, the mic is so good, I could just bring the audio into Logic Pro as is, perhaps boost the levels a little bit just to bring up the audio, but I do like to use plugins just to make it that much better. And so I'll apply, you know, a couple of different compressors, a couple of different EQs to make the audio sound that much better. So when the audio is first being recorded into Logic Pro, it sounds like this. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. Certainly not bad by any means, like just give it a little bit of a gain boost and you'll be golden. But I always like to take it up a notch and so I do apply several different plugins to really enhance the audio. So the first plugin that I use is a de-hum from Isotope. This is just to remove any hum sounds from the natural room tone. It's definitely not necessary but I just like to use it. Next I apply this plugin from Isotope called Ozone Pro. Uh, essentially this is just a glorified EQer but I come in here and I use one of the presets and specifically one of the signature presets from Greg Calby. I don't know who that is. But anyways, it's called General Clarity, and I just think it sounds really good. And this is what it sounds like before and after with this plugin added. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. Next, I apply a de -esser. This simply removes any of the excess S sounds in the audio. It's typically very subtle, but here's the before and after. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's Here's how it sounds. Next, I apply two compressors back to back. These are the CLA 2A compressors from Wave. The CLA 2A is a very famous compressor modeled on the legendary Electro optical tube compressor. Essentially though, this compressor just emulates the original compressor and it makes your vocals really shine. Here's a before and after. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's 
just how it sounds. And then these last two plugins, the limiter, this just helps to keep the audio a little bit more leveled. Let's just say, for example, that I say a word in a sentence and that one word is a little bit louder than the other words in the sentence. A limiter will sort of help to balance it out and make it all sound more even. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. This is an official audio test of the Sennheiser MKH416. Here's how it sounds. And then a D reverb, which I don't always use, but sometimes depending on where I'm recording in my office, there will be a little bit more reverb in the audio. And this D reverb plugin from Isotope helps to remove some of that reverb, okay? So that is my audio setup. And of course, I'll include links to all these things down below in the description. Next, let's talk about my lighting. So as you saw from earlier, I use the Aperture um, 120D Mark II, right? Uh, I explained to you why I use this light. I told you it's gonna cost you about $1,400 for the entire setup, the light itself, the dome, uh, the C-stand if you want something that's really sturdy. But now I'm gonna actually demonstrate it to you. I'm gonna show you exactly why it's crucial to have super high quality light. So this is my chair shot with zero lighting, right? Obviously it's really bad, it's super dark. However, this is what my chair shot looks like if I were to use this $80 light from Amazon. And this is the same exact chair shot if I were to use the $200 light from Amazon. And finally, this is the same exact chair shot if I were to use this $900 light with a $300 light dome to help reflect the light beautifully. And so, obviously, you can see the difference here. In my opinion, investing in a super high quality light is one of the best investments you can make if you want to improve your video quality. However, in addition to this light, something else that makes my shots look so good, aside from the color grading, obviously, which we'll talk about later, but aside from that are the practicals, okay? So the practicals are things like these lights, right? Boom. Practical. 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 So in this shot, I'm not using any background practicals, just my main light, and here's what that shot looks like. However, here's the same exact shot except with the practicals turned on. Boom significantly better, right? Just by turning on a few natural lights in the background, it helps to create much more depth, color, and visual interest in your shot. And the same thing is true with this shot. Here's what the shot looks like without the background practicals, the, the lights in the bookshelf. And here's what the shot looks like with the background practicals turned on, right? It makes a huge difference. It adds a lot more visual interest and texture to the shot. Now, in terms of the actual lighting placement itself, what you'll notice is that my light is off to the side. If I'm sitting here in the center, I don't have the light directly in front of me in the center. And the reason I do it this way is in my opinion, I just think it looks, it looks a lot more interesting. It creates a more cinematic look where one side of my face is really well lit. And it's not that the other side is dark. It's not like pitch black over here, but it's not as well lit as this side. And it just creates a more interesting cinematic look that I like. And so that's how I set up my light. Again, here's an example of the light if it were to be placed directly in front of me. It's not that it's not a well-lit shot, but in my opinion, it just doesn't look as good as this. This is the same exact shot with the light moved to the side. And when I say to the side, I obviously don't mean that it's like directly on my side. The light is still in front of me, but it's just shifted toward one side. And you'll notice that I also have the light a little bit higher pointing down on me. Once again, this just helps to create a more cinematic look with the shadows that it creates on my face. And I do the same exact thing for my chair shot as well. The light is in front of me, but shifted toward one side, which gives it a much more natural look where one side of my face is brighter than the other. Okay, so now I'd like to really quickly talk about the green screen and how I like that. So the most important thing about the green screen is gonna be that the entire green screen is as evenly lit as possible. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. I move this light right here, right? So this side of the green screen is, it's well lit. This side is not. The problem with that is if I were to bring, if I were to record this and I'm on the green screen, if I were to bring this into post-production and try and key out one of these sides, 
the software is not going to know what shade of green to pick up on because there's two different shades of green because they're not lit equally. And so the trick is that you just want to light it evenly. So the way I have it set up is that I've got this light here and it's typically not pointing at me. It might create a little bit of a cast right here, but the primary light, which I'm not going to bring over here now, but it's, it's the big dome light. And so I'll have that pointing at me on the side. Again, it's, it's at an angle on the side but it's helping to fill in this space over here. And so I've got this light filling in this, and then the other light is on me, but also filling in the rest of the green screen, okay? Also, one more thing, I almost forgot to add this. You wanna make sure that the green screen is as wrinkle-free as possible. Now, I know you might have some creases in there, you might have a couple of small wrinkles, but that's not too bad, because it's not gonna, it's not so wrinkly that the wrinkles are creating additional shadows, right? Um, when the wrinkles start creating additional shadows, if I had a light right here, which I would normally, it would help to eliminate all these shadows that the wrinkles are creating. But if you have too many wrinkles, there's gonna be lots of little small shadows all across your green screen, and it's gonna give you the same problem in post-production where your software is not gonna be able to know what shade of green to focus on to key out. Let's talk about your on-camera presence now, right? How do other people perceive you when they're watching you? Your on-camera presence is extremely important because if you're talking about something, but it seems like you lack conviction or you lack confidence in the thing you're talking about, then generally speaking, people are not gonna wanna listen to you for a long time. And so one of the questions that I got from you guys was, Joshua, how do I break free from camera shyness? That's a real thing. Like, how do I break free from being shy in front of the camera. I wanna start a personal finance YouTube channel, but I don't feel confident enough. I remember I saw a video a while back, um, it was a Graham Stephan video, and he was talking about literally this exact same thing. He posted something on Reddit saying, I don't feel like I'm confident enough or have the personality to be a YouTuber. I don't have the personality, balls, or charisma to start my own channel. I am not the type that would do well in front of the camera. But thankfully, after years of doubting myself, I just finally got to the point where I just said, it. I'm going to film a YouTube video and I'm gonna get over my fear about putting myself out there. Listen guys, if you wanna break free from camera shyness, if you wanna have more confidence on camera, I could sit here and I could give you, you know, exercises. I could say to you, listen to music that's gonna hype you up before you start recording, or, you know, uh, say to yourself in the mirror a hundred times, I'm confident, right? And certainly that stuff could help a little bit, but it's not gonna fit the root cause of the problem. And the root problem, the reason that you're so shy in front of the camera, the reason that you lack confidence is because you care too much about what other people are gonna think about you. I mean, think about this for a second, right? Are you shy in front of your mom or your dad or your best friend, right? You're probably not shy in front of those people because you trust them, because you know that they're not going to judge you for who you are. But the moment you get on camera, you are aware of the fact that there are gonna be thousands of people, potentially tens, hundreds, millions of people who are watching you, who could potentially judge you, and that's what makes you shy. That's what makes you lack confidence when you're in front of the camera because you just care too much about what other strangers are gonna think about you. I know it's a lot easier said than done, and it's gonna take practice, but you cannot care what other people think about you. If someone feels like they wanna judge you because of the way you look, or because of the way your voice sounds, or because of the way you talk, the cadence of your voice, whatever. If somebody feels like they wanna judge you because of that, understand it has nothing to do with you. Them judging you is just a reflection of themselves. Like th they're making fun of you, they're saying things about you because they feel bad about themselves in those areas that they're making fun of you for. Or perhaps they're just jealous of you because they lack the confidence themselves to also be in front of the camera, but you're taking the step and you're getting in front of the camera and because of that, they're jealous of you and so they're just gonna make fun of you, right? Listen guys, you are going to have haters. It's that's it's inevitable. If you have an audience that's big enough, there will be people who comment on your videos, who say mean things. But listen to me, the overwhelming majority of people who comment on your videos and who watch your videos are gonna be supportive, are gonna be kind, are gonna be encouraging. And so you shouldn't be concerned about being yourself in front of the camera because most people are gonna love you for who you are. You will have the haters, of course, but that's very few and far between. Okay, let's transition now and talk about my editing. The software that I use, where I get my titles from, how I color grade, and my entire process from start to finish. To edit my videos, I use Final Cut Pro. 
it's the only thing I use. Titles, editing, any special effects that you've seen me use, it's all done in Final Cut Pro. I don't use After Effects, I don't use Premiere Pro, I don't use anything else except for Final Cut Pro. Now, Final Cut Pro is only available on Mac OS. And so if you don't have an Apple computer, unfortunately, you won't be able to use Final Cut Pro, but alternatively, you can use Premiere Pro. One of the questions that I got was, Joshua, why is it that you use Final Cut Pro instead of Premiere Pro? And it really just comes down to personal preference. Both Final Cut Pro and Premiere Pro are top of the line, non-linear editing software. But the reason that I personally like Final Cut Pro more is because it's just far more user-friendly, intuitive, and just stable. The user interface on Final Cut Pro is sleek, modern, and everything just sort of works. And there are features in Final Cut Pro like the magnetic timeline, which I just love, and it's probably saved me thousands of hours in editing time. But anyways, that's why I use Final Cut Pro. Let's really break it down now and talk about my entire editing process from start to finish. And so I start out and the first thing that I do is I import my footage into Final Cut Pro from my camera's SD card. I'll also export the audio out of Logic Pro and import that into Final Cut Pro as well. And then I'll use Final Cut Pro's auto sync feature to sync the audio and the footage together. And once the sync is done, it'll give me this one file here that I can then drag into my timeline to start color grading. And so as you can see, the footage looks looks awful. As I mentioned earlier, I shoot in S-Log3, which is a very, very flat and just dull color profile, but it gives me significantly more control over how my final image is going to look. And so I've got this here preset that I use, that I built, that when I apply it to my footage, it automatically grades my footage for me. I have spent countless hours tweaking this and adjusting it to be perfect. But let's really break down what's going on here, okay? So you can see that I'm using three different LUTs on my footage. All of them are are currently turned off, but we're gonna turn them on one by one and talk about each one. So LUT stands for lookup table, and it's basically just a way for you to save a color grade as a template. This first LUT here is just meant to do a basic color correction of the flat S-Log footage. And so you can see when I turn it on, the image becomes a little bit more saturated and a little bit less dull, but it's still not anything special. The next LUT that I use is called TIG Enhanced IT, and it's a LUT from the YouTuber That Icelandic Guy, and I'll link it down below. So I've turned that on and I've got the mix set to 65% out of 100% just because I don't want to overdo it. The trick with color grading and using LUTs is to not overdo the grading, right? The minute you start applying too many LUTs or adding too much to your color grade, it starts to look a little bit less natural and visually less appealing. And then the final LUT that I use is from the same LUT pack from that Icelandic guy, but it's called TIG Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, not the best name for a LUT, but it looks really great. So you can see this LUT really is is the cherry on top. It adds a little bit of a blue to the image that just makes it feel super crisp and cinematic and I just really love the way it looks. And I've got this LUT set to 50%. And so that's, that's my color grade. And what you'll kind of find is, like you can copy my exact color grade down to the exact detail, but what you'll kind of find is that based off of your set, your lighting, the size of your room, your skin tone, camera that you're using, all these different factors are gonna change the way your shot looks. And so even if you try and copy my exact color grade, you're not gonna necessarily get the same end result. And so basically what you just have to do, I mean, this, this took me probably about six months to perfect this. It's gonna take persistence. It's gonna take you consistently making really small adjustments to your lighting, to your angles, to your, you know, your settings in your camera, to your LUTs in, in your actual software. It's gonna take a lot of small little adjustments for months on end before you can finally get to a point where, where you're like, I really like the way this looks. That's how I got to this point here. I didn't just wake up one day, throw a few LUTs on here, and like magic, it looks this good. I mean, this takes practice to get like this, right? But I promise you, if you just do it, if you just practice it, make the adjustments, make the small tweaks, you'll get a shot that you're really proud of. Anyways, once the grade is done, the editing begins. Now, I do all of the editing by myself. I don't outsource any of my editing, and my process is basically broken down into five major steps. First thing I do is the rough A cut, and then the final A cut. Next is titles, and then B-roll, and then finally the camera effects, which includes the zoom in, zoom out that you guys had questions about. And so the rough A cut is where I go through, I've got my giant clip here, and I just go through and start cutting and chopping. Now, when I'm recording, I don't ever stop recording. Like for example, 
if I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm saying my script and I mess up a line. I don't like reach up and stop the camera. I just keep it recording. The whole time I just keep it continuously going. And so the purpose of the rough A cut is I'm just going through and I'm cutting out all the bad and I'm keeping the good. I'm not too concerned about how tight the edits are and here's an example of what I mean by that. It can do a little bit more than Final Cut Pro, which is why like professionals use it more often for what I'm doing here on YouTube. Final Cut Pro just make You can see that there's quite a bit of a gap there and it's very distracting, but that's fine because once I finish the rough A cut, I'm gonna go back through and do the final A cut. And the final A cut is where I go through and I start tightening up all these clips, trimming the ends, using J and L cuts to make the cuts flow a little bit better and just making it all seem like one seamless take. And then once I finish the uh, final A cut, it's time to go through and start doing the titles, okay? And so the way I do this is I'll start off by just watching the video and I'll go through and I'll add titles wherever I see fit. Now, sometimes I will indicate in my script where I might wanna use titles, but most often I'm just kind of doing it based on feel. Now I know you guys had a lot of questions about the titles, the titles that I use in my videos. And for the most part, I would say 95% of them are pre-made templates. Most of the titles that you see me using are coming from uh, Motion VFX. I've literally searched everywhere. And although I have used other templates in the past, none even come close to the quality of Motion VFX. They are definitely a bit on the more expensive side compared to the other templates out there. But for the quality, in my opinion, they're totally worth the price. Someone asked me specifically where I got the circle border countdown template that I use uh, sometimes in my videos. Uh, those templates come from Motion VFX from this plugin here called M Counter. And of course, I'll include a link down below to their website. Now, I've also gotten titles and templates from other sites as well, uh, such as Lino FX, Envato Elements, Motion Array, and Pixel Film Studio. But again, basically the only titles and templates that I use now come from Motion VFX. So that's titles. And after I do titles, I move on and I start adding B-roll. Now, my B-roll, stock footage, and animations I get from a variety of websites. Most of the B-roll and stock footage that you see comes from Film Pack, uh, Envato Elements, and Pexels. Now, Pexels is 100% free to use, but the other two do require subscriptions. Now, a lot of my animations that you've seen in my videos, I would say probably most of them I'm building myself in Final Cut Pro, but a lot of them as well, like for example, if it's an image of a stock chart like moving and it kind of just looks cool, that's probably coming from Envato elements this site has a massive amount of digital assets and stuff to choose from and I highly recommend it okay and so after I finish adding the b-roll the final part of my process is actually going through and adding all the cut-ins the cutouts the zoom-ins the blurs all the camera stuff you guys see me doing with my shots to get it like moving and so it's not just one still shot um, that all happens on this final part, okay? And I know you guys really wanted to know how I did my actual camera of movement thing where like it looks like it's being handheld, like it is now because it is handheld. But in my videos, it's on a tripod and I just do all that movement in post-production. The zoom ins, the blurs, the handheld motion. And so let me show you how to do that as well. So I actually recently discovered a plugin that you can use from Lino FX. And basically this plugin comes with dozens of different camera movements, including the actual racking focus. It's super easy to use. And honestly, I wish I discovered it a long time ago because it would have saved me so much time in my editing process. However, if you don't feel like spending money on this template, you can do this same exact thing with the pre-built uh, tools in Final Cut Pro and Premiere Pro. It's what I did for you know, months until I found this plugin. And so let me walk you through how to do that exactly. So I've got my still footage here, and obviously this is shot on a tripod, and so it's not gonna have any movement to it. And so in Final Cut Pro, you're gonna come down here to effects and then type in the word handheld into the search. And then you're just gonna apply this effect onto your footage by dragging and dropping it. Now I'm gonna be honest with you guys, okay? I don't know if any other software has this exact effect, this handheld effect. I would imagine like Premiere Pro probably has something that's similar to it but this specifically is for Final Cut Pro. Now what I typically do is I keep the shakiness between five and 10. I find that anything higher than that is too shaky and anything below five is almost not even noticeable. And so my sort of sweet spot is a seven. And then to actually do the zoom in and zoom out effect, you're gonna come down here to where it says transform and basically just keyframe the scale, okay? And so for example, if I were to start my keyframe right here, and then I'm gonna go just like a few seconds in, and then I'm just gonna apply another keyframe, uh, but this time I'm gonna scale in the footage. Maybe let's go from 100 to, I don't know, 130. 
And so it looks pretty good. Um, and the trick here is you don't want it to go too slow, right? Like the, the keyframes shouldn't be too far apart because when you zoom in, typically when it's handheld, the zoom's happening kind of fast, right? And so to recreate that look where it looks like it's actually being handheld, you want the zoom to happen pretty quickly. Like it shouldn't be a slow zoom in unless that's just kind of the effect that you're going for, which in that case, it's fine. And then to add the actual blur effect, you're just gonna come back down here to search and you're gonna type in Gaussian, okay? And so you're gonna apply a Gaussian blur to the footage. And basically what I do is to make it look realistic, I'm gonna go to the first keyframe before we start scaling it. And so the first keyframe is at 100% and I'm gonna bring the Gaussian blur amount down to zero. And basically what I'm gonna do is once that zoom starts, I might go a few frames in, and then once the zoom starts after a couple of frames, I'm gonna go ahead and activate the Gaussian blur keyframe on the amount. And then I typically go to the end of the zoom. So like the last keyframe of the scale, once we hit 130, and I'm gonna maybe bump up the Gaussian blur amount to about a five or so. And then from there, I'm gonna go a few more keyframes after the zoom is finished, right? Because like the cameraman or camera woman has to adjust their focus after the zoom and I'm gonna pull this amount back down to zero and it's gonna automatically create a keyframe. And then so the final effect looks like this. I mean, it looks pretty good, right? It looks pretty realistic. Again, if you don't wanna buy the Lino FX plugin, which, you know, is super helpful, it's all I use now personally. If you wanna do this for free though, it can be done using the built-in tools. That's what I did for the longest time. And, you know, so it definitely works. It's just gonna take a little bit more time. Okay, so let's talk about thumbnails now. I would say that right behind the topic or idea of your video, the thumbnail is the most important part of the video. You could have the greatest video of all time. The content could be amazing, but if your thumbnail's bad, then nobody's ever gonna click on the video, therefore nobody will actually ever see the video. And so my thumbnail process is broken down into five separate steps. And the first step is actually coming up with the idea. Now, I'll be honest with you, coming up with the idea is the hardest part of the process. And there's not like one definitive way that I come up with thumbnail ideas. I'll obviously try and find inspiration from other thumbnails that I've seen that have worked. And it doesn't even have to be thumbnails from other YouTubers in my niche, right? In the personal finance niche. I mean, I'm looking at YouTubers across all niches on YouTube because I just wanna see what's working in general. And I might even go and study the thumbnails to see why they're working. But the biggest thing with the thumbnails is you want to one, capture somebody's attention, two, tell a story with your thumbnail that captivates the viewer that makes them want to actually click on the video and three you do want to clickbait because that's what's going to get people to actually click onto the video however there's a very thin line between good clickbait and bad clickbait you don't want to lie about what's inside the actual video with bad clickbait and so when I say capture somebody's attention what I mean specifically is when somebody is scrolling through YouTube right and you probably do this as well there are hundreds of videos being suggested and recommended to them right and so they're just scrolling they're scrolling scrolling and they're scrolling and your thumbnail needs to be colorful enough. It needs to use the right fonts. You need to be making the right facial expression. Uh, so much so that it gets the person who's scrolling through all these thumbnails to stop and look at your thumbnail because it's captivating enough to get them to stop to look at it for a second. However, when they stop to look at your thumbnail, you only have maybe less than one second to, to get them to actually click onto your video. And so your thumbnail has to captivate them enough to get them to click onto the video. In a way, your thumbnail is almost kind of telling a story. And in order for the person to see the end of the story, they would have to click onto your video and watch until the end to see the whole story, but you only have about one second or less to captivate the person enough to get them to actually click onto the thumbnail, right? And so it's not easy, it takes practice, but it's definitely possible. But what you don't wanna do is clickbait so bad that you're lying about the actual content in the video, right? Like your thumbnail should at least be relevant enough to the actual content in the video. Okay, now once I actually have the idea for my thumbnail, it's time to take the photo. Now, I would highly urge you it's tempting to because it's easy, but I would highly urge you to not just take a screenshot of your video and use that as the thumbnail. Like actually take a photo, okay? And so I'm gonna show you how I take my thumbnail photos right now. So what I do is I use this white wall right here. Sometimes I have to move this painting, but I want it to be on a white wall because I'm gonna bring it into photo, which I'll show you how to do this later, but I'm gonna bring it into Photoshop, cut myself out of the background so that I can put my own custom background on it. So I use this white wall right here, and this is literally what I do. So I've got my light here. I'll turn it, point it there, and then I'll take this light over here, and I'm gonna use this light 
as a sort of backlight. So I'll have this here. Like I said, sometimes I have to take this painting down, which is fine. And this is the wall that I take it on, right? This is my lighting setup. And I may have to make a few adjustments here and there, but at this point, it's just a matter of you doing your typical YouTube pose, right? Right? So you have to do the poses, you have to, you know, take pictures of it. My camera has an automated timer on it. And so I can time it if, if, unless my wife can help me, but typically she can't. And so I'll just have a tripod set up and I'll hit the picture button and it'll count down from five or 10 or two, whatever I set it to. So I hit it, run, get into my position, do my YouTuber face, click, check it if it looks good. Then I go ahead and bring it over to the computer and I'm gonna load the picture into this uh, software called Luminar AI. And so here's my basic process in Luminar AI, okay? And this software is gonna cost you about maybe $50 or so. It's super cheap, but for what it does, I think it's really worth it, okay? And so I've got my raw image in here and it's, you know, it, it can use some work. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna click up here on edit and I'm basically just gonna go through here and just really start exaggerating and, you know, just enhancing the image. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is under this enhance AI right here, I'm just gonna turn the enhance 100%. And you can see there, what it does. It just really brings out the colors and just makes it a lot more brighter and just easier to look at. Next, I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna go to portrait and then click on face, okay? Face light, I typically bump this up to about a 50 or so. This just adds light to your subject's face and it does it all automatically, which is really cool. Next, the eyes. So the eyes are super important in thumbnails, guys. Humans will naturally look at other humans' eyes. As a, you know, that's how we communicate. We look at each other's eyes. And so it's important that your eyes and your thumbnail are visible. And so what I do is really just exaggerate my eyes. And so I'll do this by turning everything up to basically 100% minus the en enlarged eyes. This is what it looks like if the enlarged eyes were at 100%. It just looks crazy. And so I typically do about a 20 for the enlarged eyes, but you know, eye whitening, eye enhancer, red eye removal, dark circle removal, improve eyebrows, all that goes to 100%. And so you can see here, if I were to turn this face AI off, look at that, look at the difference there, right? And so that's that. Next, I go to mouth, and this is really helpful if you're smiling because you can do teeth whitening to 100% or so. And I'll typically saturate the lips and increase the lip redness and the lip darkness a little bit. Once again, because humans look at faces and so you want your face to really pop and you can do that by enhancing certain features that we typically look at, like your eyes, your mouth, your teeth, those kind of things. And then I'll typically come in here to super contrast and I'll just bump up all the contrast on the mids, the highs and the shadows. And sometimes depending on the color and how it looks when I shoot, it like for example if I have my yellow lamps turned on it's gonna kind of create this yellow orangish like cast on me and so if I come up here to color I can do this right here remove color cast and I typically bump this up to about a 50% and you can see there it basically just removes some of that color cast coming from the outside lights right and so here's the before and after very subtle but it does make a difference but then I'll come down to color harmony and I'll typically go Instead of, I don't want my shot to be too warm. And so I'll typically bring it down to about a negative 50 just to make it a little bit colder, right? And so it looks like this. In my opinion, this right here looks far better than this, <laughs> right? Before and after. There's the original shot. And this is what it looks like after I do all of those quick edits in Luminar AI. And then I'll just click on export. Uh, save to disk and I'm gonna export it as a Photoshop file just so I can get it as high quality as possible. And then once I'm happy with the picture in Luminar, I'm gonna export it from Luminar and import it into Photoshop and that's where the magic begins. Now keep in mind, at this point, I already know what the thumbnail is gonna look like. It's just a matter of actually creating it in Photoshop. And so the first thing I do when I bring it into Photoshop is I go over here to um, the object selection tool and I'm gonna actually just draw a box around myself. And Photoshop is so smart now that it can actually figure out where I'm sitting and it can, you know, highlight me. And so what I do is I highlight myself and then I come down here to mask myself out of the background, right? Super, super easy. And then I might apply a little bit of feather Sometimes I'll have to make minor adjustments to the mask. So you can see the mask is black and white. And so if I go to my paintbrush 
and I select the white color, this basically means I'm gonna draw back on some of the original image. But it's super easy, and then what I'll do is I'll just start designing the thumbnail. Now, I'm not really gonna go too deep into detail about how exactly I designed my thumbnails, Maybe that could be another video, but basically like to get good at thumbnails, it really just is a matter of you doing it over and over again. You have to practice, you have to look at other YouTubers to see what they're doing, to see what's working and you know, learn, like figure out why it's working, why they're doing certain things in their thumbnails and like start implementing those things into your thumbnails. Now, the one thing I do wanna talk to you about, once the thumbnail is finished, once you've got the final thumbnail, I'm gonna show you this really cool trick right here that is gonna make your thumbnail really pop. Since most people are watching YouTube on their phone, I think this just helps to make your thumbnail stand out that much more, okay? And so what you're gonna do is first, you're gonna create a new layer by clicking on this plus button down here. And then with this layer selected, you're gonna go up here to image and then apply image. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna create a, it's gonna basically combine your all of your layers into one layer, right? And so this top layer here is the entire thumbnail on one layer. Next, you're gonna go up here to image again, click on adjustments and then desaturate. And then I'm gonna go up here to uh, filter and then high pass. Now typically have the radius at about a five. You can see this looks pretty crazy, right? What we're gonna do is right here on this drop down, I'm gonna change this to overlay. And then I'm just gonna drop the opacity down to about a 50% or so. But you can see it really just makes the thumbnail like pop. If I turn this off, and turn it back on. Do you see the difference there? In my opinion, it looks so much better this way. And so that's a really cool trick that I do to all my thumbnails. And just a really quick shout out to my wife because she's the one that discovered that. So shout out to you, Courtney. All right, you guys. So that is the end of this video. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching until the end. I hope that you got some value from this video. If you have not already dropped a like down below for the YT Algo and subscribe to the channel, please do both those things. You guys are absolutely amazing. And as always, I will see you again very soon. Take care.